Welcome to He Did This To Me, the sports podcast from a father and son who happen to be mostly optimistic Knicks, Mets, and Jets fans. My name is Nick, a.k.a. Goody, and with me is my old man, a.k.a. the big guy, Noel. And just like his name, all we do is win. Let's get to the show. It's time to begin. The Knicks figure it out. They get it done, 118 to 115 and advance to the second round, eliminating the Philadelphia 76ers. Let's get right into it. Talk to me, big guy. How we feeling about those Knicks? Oh, loving it. Loving it right about now. You know, pretty excited about that finish. Um, you know, listen, things were a little stressed after the game the other night in the, uh, in the garden when you thought we'd shut, close it out. You and I watched that together. Very disappointing. But um, I don't know, maybe there's a precedent that we can't watch any more games together because they figured it out <laughs> last night, right? And we didn't watch the game together. But no, it's a very good win. Good um, way, way to go for the Knicks to really show themselves and really just buckle down and get it done last night. There's so many things to go over with last night's game that I'm sure we'll dig into. But overall, just have to be thrilled um, that they're here now. And listen, hey, let, let, let's get to Indiana. Let's see what Indiana's got for us. Game five was one of the tougher losses that I've ever experienced as a Knicks fan. You know, you're up by six points with, you know, less than 30 seconds to go. I think I actually looked at you and mom and said, as long as we just don't do some really dumb shit right now, we should be okay. Mm. And we proceeded to do all of the things that you can't do. The mm -hmm. Mitchell Robinson foul on Maxi to enable him to make a four point play. Josh Hart's missing free throws. Uh, it was just a, it was just a absolute gag fest by the Knicks. Just totally gave it away, and it was a tough couple of days, tough forty eight hours. I didn't, I, I consumed zero sports media. I just couldn't deal with, you know, hearing people <laughs> talk about, you know, the greatness of Embiid and how the Knicks gave it away, uh. and the 76ers have all of the, um, um, the momentum now. I was like, you know what, no. And yeah, I, I I said in my pod last night, I said, you know, me and my pops we were together for the game before that. We didn't win, so I had to switch it up. I had to switch it up. I wore, I wore the black shirt. I changed the shirt. And, um, you know, we uh, watched it from a mile away as opposed to sitting next to each other. And what a win. I mean, just an, a, a fantastic win. It, it, a win within a game, a game that within a series was a microcosm for what the entire series was. Just back and forth, up and down, seesaw roller coaster battle. And the Knicks at the end were able to make just that one extra play. They just kept making another play. And they knocked down their free throws. They hit huge shots. Like you said, mm -hmm. we'll get into that a little bit more. But what a win. And as you said, we now will face the Indiana Pacers. Tyrese Halliburton. Everybody this year was... You know, he was the darling of the NBA for the first half of the season. Most people agreed that he was the better uh, overall player when comparing him to Jalen Brunson. I think that that narrative has changed. Yeah. I think everybody else has seen what we know as Nick fans. But Halliburton also made the Olympic team over Brunson. So Brunson gets a chance during this series to show the entire world who the superior player is. And Brunson... He ends up, after two subpar games, having one of the greatest series in NBA history. Mm -hmm. And that's not hyperbolic to say. He has 41 and 12 in last night's game. He has a couple different um, instances within this series where his stat lines or his overall game stats through certain stretches put him on lists where it's a list of two people and it's him and Michael Jordan or it's him and the big O. He was you know. unbelievable. And last night, especially 14 points in the last six minutes when it was money time, he continued to show up unlike the other supposed superstar on the other side of the floor. Jalen Brunson, he, he's that guy you know he's our guy and how lucky are we to have him yeah he's um he's outrageous man i mean some of the shots this guy makes are just holy smokes i i i can't i can't remember how many times this season i've sent you that um uh, exact quote over this guy holy smokes because he makes shots that are unbelievable that the shot last night that he made where 
he goes over it's late in the shot clock and he kind of pulls up uh you know uh, in between like the baseline and the elbow on the right side Embiid is right in front of him he's got a uh, Ubre right there and he's got All Nick right. Batum and he's got nowhere really to go and he just leans to his right and, and, and puts it up and bang it goes finds a way to go in I mean he's yeah. just unbelievable I thought somebody was going to block that shot I couldn't believe he got it off I you know the guy like 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 Perk says big body fronts but Perk always seems to say Bronson yeah, I, and he still hasn't got that straight anyway um <laughs> it's just his he, accent it's Louisiana right, it. yeah, it's country <laughs> um, but no, he, he's, he's really, really an amazing young man and he's a leader, man. I mean, you know, the team follows its leader. The team takes on the personality of the leader and the coach, obviously. And you could see that with this team throughout, man, you could see, you know, and you could see it with the other team too. Honestly, you know, you, you got a coach and a um, leader there who whine and stuff like that. And that permeates the team. That's what I'm saying to you. Sometimes, even if you think, this went wrong or that went wrong. As a leader, you can't be pointing out all that, you know, little crap because it, 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 you know, filters down and it's not good for everyone to think and feel that way. And he just is a silent, steady guy who's just spectacular and an absolute um, superstar, a 1A for sure. Yeah, absolutely a 1A. Uh, some, can somebody please find Becky Hammond and Candace Parker? Can somebody please find them? I need so I I want to know. I want to talk to them. I want to hear what they got to say. I the Becky Hammond clip literally just came on um my Twitter right before I hopped on to start this podcast and uh you know, I I actually sat and watched it just just to get a little bit fired up. And the way she just talks about him so dismissively. Oh, he's too small. He's not a guy. They they don't have a guy. He's not a guy. Come on, man. This dude, yeah. there's no more talk about whether or not he's a superstar. You do nope. not have a playoff series like this one where he just it, it continues to make shots in big moments, continues to distribute the ball, and the Knicks as a whole continue to, as Tom Thibodeau always says, get better. No matter how well you play, no matter what goes on, you always want to try to get better. And after game five, the one thing that did give me a, some some confidence and got and got me feeling the right way about our chances in Game Six was the fact that everybody took accountability. That's right. Everybody took accountability. Mitch comes out, I fucked up. I can't do that right there. Brunson comes out and says, "I got to have better possessions." Tibbs comes out and says, "We got to communicate better on exactly what our um, strategy is at the end of the game." When asked about why we didn't foul Maxi. And every single person did the opposite in game six. And that's what led to the closeout. Guys hit free throws. Guys were more decisive on offense and took open shots when they got them. Brunson gave the ball up when he was in a bad position and he was double teamed. And, you know, we did what we were supposed to do. We fouled Maxi, and we did so in the backcourt. Deuce was the one who it seems didn't get the call um, to do that in the previous game. You may have fouled him a little bit early. Maybe you want to let him dribble a couple cup times there, but I'd rather you foul him early than not foul him at all. And what that did was, I thought it kept them guessing because there was another time where Maxi got the ball and he didn't, he wasn't in a position to get it with that full head of steam and we didn't foul him. And we kind of like trapped him over in the corner and made them run some time off. And he, you know, passed it to somebody. I forget exactly how that um, possession ended up, but when buddy healed caught the ball with three seconds left, he turned and rushed it up because he thought that there was a chance that we were going to foul. And he wants to try to draw the foul. He barely draws, um, you know, he doesn't draw any iron. He smashes it off the backboard. We grab the rebound. Game over. See ya. We're on to round two. So I just thought that everybody learned from the mistakes in game five. We are a team that has been resilient and has bounced back all season. No matter what is in front of us, no matter what has just happened, you know that these guys are going to stick together and they're going to play a certain way every single night. And from the very beginning, we come out with a lot of intensity. We have by far our best quarter of the playoffs, I think. Dante DiVincenzo, Dante's Inferno, who we all have been begging to get it going, comes out, hits three threes. He was three of 17 in his from, from behind the arc in his last 20 prior to those three that he hit in the first quarter. We're playing fantastic. We're up by 22 at one point. They go on a run. We're up by 14. You still feel good. And then we follow that up with the worst quarter that we've had 
for the entire playoffs. We score sure. only 15 points. Buddy Heald feels like he's back at Oklahoma. He drops, he outscores the Knicks by himself in that quarter with 17 points, bombs away. He's taking dribble, fade away in the corner threes. And it all started because we were doubling Embiid. And then we realized, okay. We need to fall away from that. And now we have Hartenstein guarding him straight up in the third quarter. He's going straight to the rim and laying Hartenstein up sometimes because of that. But we're not letting these other guys get off. And I, I, I say all this to give credit to Tom Thibodeau. Mm -hmm. You know, the one criticism I've had of Tibbs that has probably been, you know, the most glaring weakness of his, in my opinion, was that I thought that last season, specifically against Miami, he was a little slow to make adjustments. Seemed like Spolster was making adjustments on the fly. We were making adjustments in between games. Well, I've said all season that I've seen him make adjustments in games that are, you know, just a, just a, 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 a very good um, window into the fact that he has switched up his thought process on some things and he's trying to be better. And he's continuing to evolve and get better as well. And he did a fantastic job with that yesterday and getting away from that double team. That was extremely important. And like you said, your coach, your main player, they are the guys who end up becoming the personality of the team. Mm -hmm. And I see this team in the way they're set up right now. And I look at it like, yo, could this be like, this could be like the Spurs when they got Duncan. And, you know, they just had those years of, of bringing in players who, were not highly touted or not great on another team and making them level up. And they have a whole team that just plays the game the right way because of who their leaders are. There's no doubt. I mean, look, man, the Knicks, listen, that first quarter, Nick, yesterday, the way they were moving the ball, and it, just, it wasn't just that they shot well, they shot well, but the way they were moving the ball and moving their bodies without the ball mm -hmm. was the best we've seen all year. I mean, yep. that was fantastic. And we're going to need a lot more of that. But, um, you know, where where the, the the culture is really, it's growing. It's growing. It's getting stronger and stronger. And you see it. You feel it. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people are going to want to come to play here. You know, it's going to be interesting these next few years to see how the organization handles um, some prosperity, you know. so Well, yeah. not, not according to uh, The Athletic. A lot of players are not going to want to come here, but that's fine. Keep them away. Just like Why, Josh Hart says. Kids? Yeah. 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 That's yeah. just like Josh yeah, Hart says. He says, man, y'all so soft. What'd you say? You don't believe it? No, I don't need that guy. Oh yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, I don't, don't want to come either. here because of Tibbs. I don't care. I don't want that guy. Exactly. Because Tibbs is our guy. And beyond that, come on, man, you see real tangible results to his coaching style and to the way we put this team together and the way he runs this team. I mean, I'm sorry, man, but anybody who still has beef, oh, Tibbs sucks and all that, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Just go away. I mean, sorry. Anybody who's been watching the Knicks long enough knows that what, what we're doing right now after not making the playoffs for what, seven or eight seasons, and then Tibbs gets here and we make it three out of four years? You, you want to go back to that? Come on. Keep that shit. Get it away. Yes. Tibbs. Uh, Tibbs had a masterful series. He had a fantastic series. I, I thought that, you know, he had a couple questionable um, decisions in game five. And I love the fact that he owned up and made adjustments to those. But I mean, let's really get into it and talk about some of the things Tibbs did. Mm -hmm. First of all, I thought the switching of Dante onto Maxi was huge yeah. because Dante, it was Josh Hart guarding Maxi before. Josh Hart's a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. Dante is He's quicker laterally, and yeah. he and, and he also has very active hands. Yeah, and he forces Maxi into having a game where he's six of eighteen and scores seventeen points. If you tell me Maxi is going to score seventeen, I'm like Nick's going to win all day, every day. Okay, now I know it would end up being a you know very close game. It was you know only three points, but you feel like the Knicks are going to win. It's a, you feel like it's a win for the Knicks if they keep Maxi to only 17 points. And it wasn't just Dante switching on to him. We also were crowding him on the pick and roll. Absolutely. So when he's coming, we were not letting him just turn that corner and go straight to the rim and put up one of those high shots that just kisses off the glass and just, you know, just, 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 just drops it. And you're like this freaking guy, man, does he ever miss that shot? We were like, listen, even if it's Embiid that we're doubling off of, we're not going to let you do that all day. 
Okay. No. We're just not. So I thought that was another great adjustment. I mean, compare that to the way that they seem to never being able to be, be able to make an adjustment on Jalen Brunson. Jalen Brunson made the adjustment after the first two games. They never made the adjustment to be able to curtail him or, you know, uh, even slow him down in the slightest. He ends up going on and just having an unprecedented four run stint. I mean, four game stint where he just just torches them over and over again. And they got nothing for him, whereas we were able to make an adjustment and slow Maxi down and get them eliminated. And I thought the like not like I said before, not doubling him beat after the second quarter was super important. I just think that Tibbs really showed in this particular series his growth as a coach and his strong suits as far as the type of mindset that he makes these guys play with and his counterpart. I mean, come on, Nick Nurse. Nick Nurse is a fraud. 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 He's not that good. I mean, he's he he's okay, but I don't see him doing anything that spectacular, Nick. I, I just don't. Um you know, sorry, but you know, but then again, you know, look, it's, it's also, I guess, very subjective, you know, but um, I, I think he's, I think he's average. That's what I think. I think he's average and I could point to some specific things that he did just in last night's game that I think were bad coaching. First and foremost, how does Buddy Heald not get, not play the entire third quarter? I didn't really understand that. I mean, I guess maybe you didn't want... You don't want to use them to – I don't know. There's, I, I, don't, I don't understand. He just had 17 and a quarter. He's your best right. player on the floor other than Embiid well, right now. Player, but defensively, they felt maybe they felt they would lose something. I don't know. I, they should have gotten them in. He single-handedly brought them back in the second quarter after we were waxing them. I agree. I, I can't see why. I don't think why. I don't know. You don't let that guy sit. And he's a shooter, man. He's a shooter who has had a tough season ever since he came over – to the 76ers, he's been terrible in the playoffs. The guy gets his first, you know, good quarter in the entire playoffs. He brings your team back, and then you let a guy like that sit for an entire quarter after sitting for, through an entire halftime? Makes Great. zero sense. He should have been the first person off the bench. you got to figure out a way to get him in. And just, hey, even if you throw him in and to just early, and it's not necessarily what's typically your rotation, but you got to see if this guy's going to come in and just, you know, start bombs away again. And then it's like, okay, well, we're riding with him tonight. It's another thing that Tibbs does very well is ride the hot hand. I think mm -hmm. that when Tibbs took out uh, 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 Mitchell yesterday, Mitchell Robinson, mm -hmm. I thought we, I thought when he took him out in the fourth, he planned on bringing Hartenstein in for a little bit and then bringing Mitch back because Mitch was doing the better job as far as defending Embiid throughout last night's last night's game. He's a little bit stronger and B can't push him around and just bowl him over. Like right. um and he's got a little bit more length. You know, he actually blocks Embiid's shots and he was frustrating Embiid and B committed the offensive foul at one point because Mitch was fronting him and denying him the ball and he was getting annoyed. Nick Mitch had six offensive rebounds and I'm telling you I thought Tibbs at that time was thinking I'm going to bring Mitch back in to close out this game. But then you know what? In the fourth quarter, Isaiah Hartenstein came in and he played fantastic. That floater was super important for us. Um, he was, you know, when he's got that float game going, that is huge for us. So I thought that they both had very impactful minutes. Mitch, specifically in the third quarter, was able to come in and slow Embiid down a little bit. Embiid was starting to kill us in the third quarter. And Mitch came in and, you know, he, he threw a little bit of water on that fire. And then Hartenstein with, you know, 14 and nine, like I said, the float game was working. He was getting offensive rebounds. They both had a very, they both have very good series, and I hope that they both, you know, continue to, you know, stay healthy. Especially Mitch, it's good that Mitch gets a few days to rest and, you know, get that foot right. And Embiid, he, he, as much as he did have a big game, he had 39 points. Fairly sure, I'm pretty sure he had 14 rebounds or something like yeah. that. And but what he always does is he wilts as the game goes along, and yeah. it's not just this year with him being hurt. It's throughout his career in the playoffs, his fourth quarter numbers are not good. He had one rebound in the entire fourth quarter yesterday. He was 6 of 26 in the fourth quarter for the entire series. And he had 10 turnovers in the last two fourth quarters alone. And it just seems like when it's winning time, our superstar continued to step up and he continued to come up small. And no I'm tired of people talking about his injury. The guy had a 50 piece in this series. He averaved you know well over 30 saying? points. He's he he was good enough to get it done. 
Okay. But this is not about this season. Ah, oh, well, you know, it's a, it's a lost season for the Sixers because I've heard this multiple times today. It's a lost season for them because this guy, he's been, you know, he, cause Joel got hurt. And before he got hurt, he was doing this. You're an idiot. If you think that you're going to go into a season and you're not going to deal with Joel Embiid missing significant time during the season and mm -hmm. being dinged up and not being 100% or being out of games in the playoffs, that's a foregone conclusion. That's what's going to happen. That's wow. what happens every single year. Yet people act like, oh, it's some anomaly. And, you know, they want to give these guys all these excuses. You know, I don't like Joel Embiid. He's a crybaby. He's soft and he does dirty shit. And I'm tired of him getting a pass. He, he, he every, every nobody wants to coronate Jalen Brunson, but he's the one that performed like the true superstar, like the true one A in this series, not Embiid. There's no doubt about it. And you know, you know, I'm the president of the anti Joel Embiid club. I have <laughs> been for years. I think I founded the club. Um, the the issue with this guy is honestly, now, yeah, he gets these injuries. They're very frustrating. I'm sure for him. And for the fans, okay? I get it. But you know what, Nick? If something ain't working, I, I don't know what this guy does in the offseason, okay? But you know what, Nick? Think about this. Remember how many years I used to say Carmelo Anthony? Great player, but he could get he could, he could get in better shape. He could get trimmed down a little bit. He, he doesn't have enough lift, I always used to say. But then, and you always used to say to me, well, Dad, that's just his body. He's a professional basketball player. He's in good shape. Clearly, Carmelo Anthony, not listening to me, of course, but decided to make some changes, I'm sure, in his diet and in his workout regimen before, like, his last two years of playing that journeyman ball. And you saw the difference. You saw the difference in him getting up and down the court. If I'm Joel Embiid, I'm going ringing LeBron's bell. I, I, I'm talking to Carmelo Anthony. What did you do to make the change? He's got to do something different, okay? He's been in the league long enough now. He keeps getting the same results. I don't see any noticeable change in his body. And I'm sorry, Nick, like you said, even the years where he's not necessarily injured, if you look at the statistics, he wilts in the latter parts of the game. That is nothing but if, what, how good a shape you're in. I'm, I'm sorry, but what else can it be? You know, if you're showing consistently wilting at the end, it has to be you're not in the best physical condition or not in good enough physical condition to handle the workload that is being put upon you and you know that's the facts man i'm sorry but that's it and i mean beyond all that you know the whole crybaby thing and dirty play thing i always thought he was a crybaby i didn't know as much about the dirty play thing as much before this series i mean it was glaring okay and he's a he's a crybaby and he's a dirty player and he's a punk there's a difference some guys are dirty players but they're they're actual badasses, you know. I mean, they're 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 actual they're they're real life jerks. I th I think uh, Draymond can be a bit of a dirty player someday sometimes, but he's not a punk. You know what I mean? Um, well, maybe maybe sometimes. Who knows? He punches um, defenseless guards, so we'll never know. Um, but no, but um, um, this guy and B, and the thing is, Nick, his career is only going to go down from here. Okay, as he gets older. That guy, what is he, 30 years old now? He's not, he's not going to be, he's not going to be very good when he's 36. If he's in the league at all. Okay? It's only going to go downhill from here. And I got one other thing to say about Embiid that's really um, pissing me off. How is it that we're going to let him play on the U.S. team? Yo! What's up with that? How? Okay. How could yeah. they let him play on the U.S. team? They should not. And not to mention, dude, have some fucking personal pride. Why don't you go to get him down with Team Cameroon? Go get with Cameroon. And, yo, if I'm a Sixers fan, I'm like, dude, you don't need to be playing any extra No, basketball. I don't want Brunson to play, and he's not even hurt. <laughs> I want him to chill on an island this summer. You know, <laughs> the, the little waves and the little fishies swimming around his feet. No, well, man, if, if you're a bead, you're insane if you're thinking about playing. Insane. Have some, like, Euro guy smash into his knee? Come on, man. That's, <laughs> dude, bad idea. Yeah, some 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 dude from a from a country with the last name is Stan. Just, yeah. you know, just like in some qualifying rounds, just smashing him up. Yeah, 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 that's not good. And they got to, listen, they got to start building around Tyrese Maxey. Now, mm -hmm. they do have mm -hmm. a good, um, they have a good cap situation 
going into this next year. You know, Maxi, I, I I love this guy's game, man. He, he's, he, you know, he's the one person I come away and I got some respect for him. I got, mm-hmm. I, you know, who I actually I weirdly have some respect for Kelly Oubre. I, you know, I just he think like, he's, he plays hard. He's a dog. He you know what I mean? I, I, would, and, I, would, I would take Kelly Oubre on my team. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, Kelly yeah, Oubre, yeah. Maxi, not Tobias. Sorry. Yo, so, Tobias, this? no show Harris. Yo, that guy. Mr. Basketball of New York. Oh, for two. Yeah, Long Island, right? Um, mm-hmm. Yo, O for two, zero points. And this past season, he made $39 million. Dude, I, I, listen, I know they're ripping him in the Philly papers. If he was in New York, I literally yo. think he would have to leave town in the dark of night. Remember when Cash used to say this? He was like mellow light. Oh, God. <laughs> yo, Tobias Harris was such a no-show. Oh, my God. How do you shoot two shots? And, and they chose him shots. over. They chose him over Jimmy Buckets. Jimmy Butler's uh, famous quote: "Tobias Harris over me." Tobias Harris over me. They decided to give this guy that money instead of Jimmy Butler. And that is one of the all-time worst decisions by a front office. And there's a lot of bad decisions by Philly. You know, this whole process. People forget about the the Markel Fultz's of the world. People forget about, um, you know, your guy, Ben Simmons. This process has not been so linear, and Joel Embiid can't get out of the second round. Never been to a conference final. Only MVP ever to have that distinction. And Tobias made 39 and change combined. OG, Josh Hart, DiVincenzo, and Deuce make around 48. That's insane. It's insane, That's, man. Is that all Daryl Morey? Who made those decisions? I mean, he's the he's the current guy making the decisions. Yeah. Um, okay. I mean, I I know there was uh it's not Sam Who's Presti. Who's the process guy? Not it's not Sam, Sam Presti. Presti. Um Sam no, Presti it's not Sam Presti, it's an OKC. Um, yeah. yeah, it's uh what was that guy's name? Because this Carol was the uh Maury came over from um from um Houston. Who was the I, guy I before that? I, Sam Hinky, Sam Hinky. Hinky, Hinky. I think if I'm the owner of Philadelphia, I'm losing my mind. I mean, think about think about the well. Listen to me. They they're doing shit like the Knicks used to do, constantly bringing in these high price names, you know, and and big name. Listen, Ben Simmons bust. Um, Markel Fultz bust. Uh, uh, um, your man James Harden, the beard, total and absolute bust. Jimmy Butler, great player. Let's get him out of town. It's just, it's, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's really bad. It really has been a, you know, a comedy of errors here recently. And, you know, like I said, Maxi, he, I, not only do I respect him for his game, but I also loved the way that he held, that he, you know, handled himself in post-game interviews, That's taking right. responsibility, uh, you know, for times where he didn't make the correct plays and, you know, the exact opposite of what his coach does. Nick Nurse last night was blaming, talking about the refs and the fact that they don't, um, you know, how to understand how Maxi ends up on the floor so much, but he never gets a call. And he's like, yo, they're just they're just not going to make that foul call, even though it's a foul. So you have to make adjustments, which I almost thought that was like him calling out Maxi in some way. When, again, another thing that I thought that Nick Nurse did that was idiotic on that last play. The ball's got to get to Maxi. We're not well, going to I Buddy think- Heald. I think that um, some people were saying that you don't throw it to Maxi in the backcourt because they felt that they would just foul him immediately. There's no way he would be able to get off a shot or they, we would foul him before he would get off a shot. So they think the plan was to get it to Buddy Heal there and they, they, they rushed it, Nick. And I mean, I mean Buddy Heal just needed to get across the timeline, which is already it was. And then Maxi's coming right there. Give Maxi the ball. I guess Buddy Heal decided, you know, he didn't want to try to make a pass. But he should have given it up to uh, Maxi. It was enough time. Dad, I'm a big believer in you do not run a play that involves a pass with three and a half right. seconds left. I get it. I get not it. with three and a half seconds left. It's just you, you now you're just asking for everything to go perfectly. Unless right. you're Villanova in the championship game that one year, you know, you do against North Carolina where they hit the walk off. You, right. you don't you you got you got come on, man. Not not especially not in the NBA. You do not run a play. You get it to Maxi. Just get it to Maxi. Okay. Just get the ball into Maxi. Try to get it to him in the front court as he's going towards the basket, obviously. But mm. just get the ball. To, you can, we cannot have the season on the line and have it be a shot from Buddy Heald. I don't care how hot he was in the what second up? quarter. 
He's he, funny yeah, yeah, he's like, yeah, he was he was hot then, and then you let him sit and get cold, and now you want him to make the, the, the most important shot of the season. Come on, man. That was not a good play design by him. I don't uh, Nick Nurse is a clown. He's a clown. I, I think that he handled himself terribly this this um series. The fact that when the 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 foul on Embiid where he hit Hartenstein in the face. I don't understand how you watch that replay and Embiid and Nurse and all these guys are all like, they've seen the replay just like we have. You did see your hit, you did see yourself hit the guy in the face with your hand, right? Right. So but Embiid, Embiid, Embiid did it. He knows it. He can still feel it on his hand, Nick. You know how you do something, you can still feel it. Yeah, he yeah. knows he hit him, yeah. but he, he's full of shit, man. He, he, the guy is just full of shit. I, that I, foul I on know. OG, that foul on OG was kind of dirty too. OG's in midair and he just pushes him in the back One and then he, and then he blocks percent. a shot. That was absolutely dirty. And again, in the park, someone's swinging on him behind that. Right. And hey, I meant to ask you earlier, I sent you that picture with OG dunking the ball on Embiid. Mm -hmm. yeah. You notice in that picture, Embiid's got his hand on Embiid, on OG's midsection. Yeah, yeah, he got the foul this call. Is another, right, there was a foul call. But that's, that's bullshit. Why? You just don't play basketball that way. You just he don't. Does certain things, he does certain things, Nick, seriously, that I said... I almost, I won't give him a pass, but he almost, it's like, dude, because you never played basketball growing up, you don't understand some of the etiquette rules of basketball. 100%. You cannot do. And someone needs to explain this to this guy because he just clearly doesn't get it on certain things and doesn't seem to want to get it. But someone should be like, yo, you can't do this. You can't push guys in the air. You can't grab somebody's legs ever, 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 you know? But no one's no one said no one wants to say that to him, and I guess that's half the problem. It, it does seem like a guy, like a foreign guy playing ball. You know what I mean? Like where that's it's like he, it. It, it, and you know, right. he, he like like you said, he picked up the game late, um, and then in addition to that, he didn't grow up his entire time in America. And yes, yeah, some of these some of these things that he does, like you said, it's just mind boggling that you think that's okay. At the end of the day, this is a fraternity, man. This is how you guys all live wonderful lives and feed your families and get to live out your dreams. You know, it's it, it's insane some of the things that he does and just how reckless they are. Brunson's a better man than me because he's going up to him yeah. and they're embracing afterwards and, you know, doing the whole covered mouth talk and having, a, you know, some sort of conversation. It looked like they were on good terms. I wouldn't have no time for that dude. Fuck him. Nope. Hey, that, that's, some, that, that's some bitch shit that you've done. Joel and bitch, as uh, you coined. And, um, man, it's just it's just – it sucks that such a great player is resorting to such dirty tactics. And it sucks that it seems like nobody, even people in the media aren't really holding him accountable. Like, right. You know, I, he does these things and, you know, Shaq, Chuck, they got nothing. They don't even bring it up. They don't even I know. bring it up. They don't even talk about it. Like, I, you know, I, I muted it during halftime yesterday. I mean, yeah. I was sitting at home yeah. with my son and I muted it because I was just like, I don't feel like listening to these guys right now. I was really annoyed that I don't get the MSG feed, um, you know, listening to the highlights with Breen giving iconic calls that I get that I miss is is very, very frustrating. Um, but I thought that, you know, it was good. I did retroactively see what they said, talking about how, you know, the Knicks are done before they both um, predicted uh, uh, blowouts. They said that the Knicks were done during halftime. And mm -hmm. yeah, man, when they storm back and they're up three at the end of the second quarter, I'm like, yo, this is not good. No, <laughs> After no. being up by that much, we don't we don't even make these guys take a couple quarters to be able to erase you know? that lead. We let them go ahead and come up and then go in with the three point advantage. Very very tough second quarter, and it was like, what is happening right now? Like, we, what did I just watch in this first quarter? This team play this beautiful basketball, intense defense, rebounding, and then all of that went out the window. I know it's a game of runs, but especially against a team like Indiana. You yeah, can't no. that you can't let them because no. they're front runners. That's the one thing that they do well is they get out in front and you know they get stuff going. And Tyrese Maxey is dancing. I'm sorry, um, Halliburton is dancing on you and shit. Yo, we got to make sure that we don't let those guys have quarters like that, and we got to make sure that we show up in first and third quarters. We've struggled with that really all season, especially with the third quarter. But in mm. this playoffs, we did a better job in the first quarter last game. We got to make sure we open each half with that certain level of intensity. Well, you know, those kind of runs against Indiana are going to have you down 17. Right. Okay, because they're going to put points up so fast. We have to, we have, we cannot, 
you know, go on those idiotic runs. Now, they're not going to play as good a defense, I don't think, as Philadelphia, okay, no. or, or as rugged a defense. So we've got to be on our offensive game also, but they haven't met with our kind of defense either. So that's going to make a difference. I think, obviously, rebound. Rebounding is going to be a big part of it. We're going to be on the offensive glass. I think we're going to play, uh, do that to these guys. We're, we're going to have a major effect on them there. I mean, what's their big man situation besides Miles Turner, who I don't think is that much of an inside guy? Um, you know, I, I don't think they're, they're, they're so great inside, but it's going to be a good series, man. And this guy, Halliburton, you know, hey, man, he, he could score the ball. You know, he could score the ball. He hasn't played nearly as well in the second half of the season as he did in the first when he was getting all the accolades. But um, he's a very good young ball player. But I, I, I do think that we can affect him, maybe switch um, DiVincenzo onto him a couple times. Um, it's going to be an interesting series. It's a reliving of all those great series we had against them from 1989 on. Um, but um, listen, it's going to be a great series. It's a great rivalry. Um, I have some history there in Indiana. We're coming for you, Benny, and um, it should be it should be fun to see how this all works out. Yeah, rivalry renewed. You know, um, if you if you if you follow those '90s Knicks teams, uh, you know a lot of people talk about the Bulls. Obviously, you have the Heat and the Pacers. Those are those are our, our true natural rivals. I was explaining that to my son uh, just yesterday because he was asking me, are, "Are the Sixers your rivals?" And I said, "Nah, can't really call them rivals. We haven't met in the playoffs enough. We don't have that much history." But um, it seems like both Indiana and Miami, through different eras, can you know keep on coming back up and keep mm -hmm. being in that um, conversation with the Knicks. As far as this next series is, is is concerned. So I do like the idea of Dante playing Halliburton some. I love the idea of OG just putting Pascal Siakam in jail. Just, right. just clank, clank, lock him up. Right. Right. Um, Miles Turner and his ability to shoot, he shot about seven threes a game in this uh, past series, and he was hitting them at a 40% 40, 40 clip. So hopefully that means he's due to go cold a little bit because that's, you know, that's a problem. And Mitch mm -hmm. does not Mitch does not guard the perimeter very well. Hartenstein does a little bit better, but now you know he can't protect the rim and he can't um, crash the board. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly how we decide to guard Miles Turner. And to me, I think OG is about to get just absolutely destroyed on the boards by whoever is in the game. And I think that we got to expand the rotation a little bit. I want to see a little Who's bit of more get destroyed on the boards. OG. Oh, no, I'm sorry. If I said OG, my bad. I meant OB. OB Toppin. OB yeah, Toppin. OB, yes. OB's about to get destroyed on the boards by whoever he's playing against on the Knicks. And OB had a good game. He did have a good game. He did have a good game. the other game. night. But come on. We know that's not the norm. That shit ain't happening over and over. And he had a decent game. series overall. Yeah, but I just, I I, you know, I just think that when it comes to the boards and when it comes to his yeah. defensive prowess, yeah. we're just going to be taking it to this cat. And I think we're going to need to expand our rotation a little bit. Yeah. You know, Deuce Precious had, has got to get Precious has got to get some run, and we might. I, I hate to say it, but we might need to see a little bit of Alec Burks. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, exactly. I was thinking that too. With no bogey. No you know, bogey. right now, right now, they got to be winding Burks up, man. They got to yeah. be doing something to him. Something. You know, get him going. Get him going. Get it, get, you know, oil the joints or something. You know, <laughs> you know, get him moving. Because <laughs> we're about to recycle you, bro. Let's go. Yeah, send that you cat down to, like, down to Chinatown or something like that. You, you know, know get him right. Loosen him up a little bit. You um, know, yo, man. We, 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 we got to do something with this guy, Alec Burks. We're go the, the, the pace that we're going to play at, I think that we need to go at least eight deep. And I really think the biggest X factor in this series is going to be Deuce. Yeah, because be on the other side, a guy that could potentially be an X factor is this guy McConnell. So these are the two yes. backup point so guards. Annoying. That guy McConnell is so annoying, and he's the type of guy who he's he killed us with Miami, right? Yeah, he killed us. He killed us this year for Indiana. He had a huge game against us in one of our matchups. And I think right before that, Josh Hart had made like a he he made a he made some sort of comment about him on a podcast about like if there was one guy that you think you could beat in a fight or something like that. He said that in the next game McConnell killed us. So we got to make sure that we don't let that guy end up you know having. Look, okay, I'll give him one good game, all right? But we can't have a thing where it's like, this guy is just, just he's all serious. We can't figure him out. No, 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 no. And I need McBride to just really outplay him. McBride didn't have his best game, 
but he had a very good series overall. He did have a three that when he hit it, it's in this, it's in the fourth quarter. I mm. think we it's about seven minutes left. And it's funny because, you know, I watched the game with um, Nazi and it's he says he's basically just parrots all the things that I say. And it's just I me. Par- and it's all the things that uh, me parroting all the things that you say. And, you know, when when Bride hits that shot, he stands up and goes, yes, Deuce. He looks at me. He's like, we needed that one. I'm like, yes, we needed that one. <laughs> it's very cool watching the game with him yesterday. He and I had a great time. Huge high five after the game. I tell you, my palms were so clammy, and my shirt underneath the arms, which I never even really sweat underneath my arms, was drenched. I was just like, yo, ah, oh, man, so much pacing, so much, you know, just standing there giving hard claps and just being like, what are we doing? The fact that we go up by like nine with the OG dunk, the throw down on Embiid. Oh, that was amazing. It was amazing. When that happened, I lost my mind. And your mom was actually on the phone with your grandmother. And she asked your mom, is Noel okay? And she was like, <laughs> yes, mom. He's just watching the basketball game. <laughs> I thought, I know we live a mile away from each other, but I thought you might have been able to hurt me because I, I, I let out a scream. I know for a fact my neighbors heard it for sure. For sure. My neighbors, probably the people across the street as well. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that was, it was a, it was a fantastic dunk. It was not an end one. It was a dunk plus the foul, but then he missed the free throw. Uh, he, was Brunson, he was too hyped up. He was too hyped up. I knew he was going to miss that foul. I he was, he was too hyped. He was too hyped. Brunson missed uh, an and one a little bit later after mm-hmm. he put o- Ubre in the, in, in the, uh, in the in spin the cycle, in the mm-hmm. blender. There you go. And then, um, you know, I, Brunson, the one thing he didn't do fantastic was shoot free throws he was 12 of 16 but he hit the two that essentially iced the game or at least put Mm -hmm. us in a position where there was no way that we could lose unless we give Mm -hmm. a four point play and you know divincenzo hits the big free throws there at the end as well just uh, all around gutty performance we win by three i I, yo the the sixers owner going out and buying 2500 tickets from himself Yo, that was so embarrassing, in my opinion, that they needed to do all that. And the car, the, the crowd was not as, you know, Knicks favorable as in game in game four. Yeah, game four. But yeah. it, you still heard your share of Nick fans in there. And, oh, no and um, you know, I loved Brunson looking up and pointing at the banners after the game. A little bit of home cooking for those guys. The the, the 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 Nova boys, as some call them, I've taken to calling them and really this whole team the gritty committee. I, like I mean, I just, you know, I just, OG, I'm so proud of OG in the way that he stepped up as this series went on. The first couple mm-hmm. of games, he was doing his thing on defense. He was playing well, but he wasn't really having any sort of impact on the offensive end. And then after that, it's like double digits. You know, he's a, he's a walking double double. He's going to get some get you some boards. He's going to get you some points. He's going straight strong to the rim. He is rising up and throwing it down on Bead twice in this series. Two posters he got on Embiid mm-hmm. this series, mm-hmm. and knocking down the open three, hit the open three at the end of the third quarter to tie the game up at 83 when we stormed back. What a seesaw battle. Then in the fourth quarter, we're up by nine at one point with like three minutes to go. We're like, yo, we're right here. We got this. Just don't blow it. All of a sudden now it's tied. Maxi goes to the rim, gets an and one with a goaltend. And I don't think either of them was the right call. I don't think either of them was the right call. I thought Hardenstein went straight up. And I thought that, um, and I thought that uh, uh, the DiVincenzo from behind definitely didn't foul him. And as far as whether or not it was a goal 10, I think it's simultaneous. I, I, haven't, I haven't seen an angle. I haven't seen a still. Yeah, but, but they, they called, called it a goal, goal 10. Right. Exactly. So they, have, so they don't have irrefutable evidence. So they're not going to go back on that. Okay, fine. I get that. But then what about the foul call? Because or there was another call where it got challenged where the actual thing that was being challenged they looked at something else within it and decided to call that instead. So I'm actually confused as far as like when it comes to the challenges, totally like exactly what, what you can and what you can't look at, what is reviewable, what's admissible in court. I don't freaking know. But at the end of the day, I thought that, you know, we fought through some tough officiating last night. I thought some of those calls against Hartenstein were really tough. I thought Isaiah, Isaiah, um, I'm sorry, uh, Josh Hart got, got thrown to the ground by campaign and that was, and that wasn't called. Um, but we just continue to fight. And I thought that Brunson, like you said, he went out of his way as this series went along to not even not even react to the refs at all and just keep his head down, keep it pushing, keep it moving forward. And that's what we did as a squad. And, you know, 
We ended up getting the job done. You did give the prediction. Nixon six. You did give that pre pr prediction. I mean, you know, we, we know that you're a bit of an oracle if we go back to your playoff picks, you know, having perfect weeks back when the um, NFL <coughs> playoffs. Now you got Nixon six. You were right with that one. Tell me what's your prediction when it comes to this next series against the Indiana Pacers starting on Monday <clears throat> at 730 Eastern. Yeah, um, I, I, I again, I'm going Nixon six. Um, but I could easily see this one pushing to seven. I felt, I don't know. I, I don't want to say I felt more, I feel more confident against these guys than I did against the Sixers, but I guess I kind of do. But <clears throat> pardon me. The issue with these guys is they're so deep and they keep coming. They keep coming. They have a lot of players. Mm -hmm. And I just hope, you know, I, that's why I'm hoping Tibbs does expand the lineup a little bit because we got to keep, we got to slow the game down to our pace. We cannot get out there and run with these guys. We'll get burned if we do that. We can't do it. So, you know, we got to slow it down a little. We got to expand the, um, expand it, the, the, the um, lineup. And I think we can win Nixon six. But, um, you know, man, I, I, I'm nervous, man. I am nervous about the series. I'm nervous going into every series. But I'm nervous about this series because I, I do think I could see where Halliburton could become that next New York villain. You know, the, 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 the where's Waldo glasses walking into the arena, the whole thing. And then he, he will say something. I mean, he's a glib young man. He will say something that pisses off Nick's faithful. And, and just like everybody got so angry and got so upset with uh, Ice Tray, they're going to find a way to hate this guy, too. You know it is. You know you know how Nick fans are. So, but I, I think it'll be a good series. I think it'll be a good battle. I don't think you're going to have, listen, I think that the people in Indiana need to be ready for the fact that it's only like a, what, 12-hour drive? Yo, Cat's going to be out there for the games, man. Okay? As cheap as those seats are going to be compared to the Garden, folks are going to be out there for the game. And I think what will happen is, like, games three and four, Folks will go out there and get and get a room between games and stay for both. I can absolutely see that because trust and believe, if I still lived in New York, I'd be considering considering it right now. Okay, the flight, the room, and the two tickets probably cost you less than it cost you to get into the building in the garden. That's right. That's right. Or just to drive, you know, right. especially if like four guys road trip. Let's go. Boom. A lot of yeah. folks will be doing that, man. I guarantee you, Route eighty. You're going to see a lot of Nick flags driving down Route 80 next, <laughs> next, next Friday, next Thursday or Friday. Trust and believe. Fact. Yeah, no, I could definitely see that being the case. I do think that they have um, a stronger fan base than Philly, though. So I think that they'll and that's, you know, that's a that's a tough environment to play in, especially once they get it going. So I do think that I don't think that we'll drown them out quite like we did in Philly. You think they have a stronger fan base than the Sixers? Why? In basketball, yeah, specifically. I don't think it's like a stronger sports city, but I think basketball-wise, right. I mean, I think Indiana obviously has a great history with just the sport in general. And yeah. I just think that the Sixers fans, I'm sorry, man, what, what happened at game four? I'll never look at them the same. You know, I, I know right. Philly fans, they're assholes. And, and Eagles fans, they travel and they seem to be, you know, pretty passionate. But when it comes to hoops and basketball fans – letting another team come in and just take over your arena like that where you're selling tickets from you know the organization and there's tickets as low as thirty dollars for a playoff game and you're in one of the top five to ten cities as far as population and supposed to have a storied you know sports fan base and that happens ah uh, you know come on man that's uh, thirty dollar tickets to a playoff game that's thirty dollars that that's unreal in today's economy and in a big city like philadelphia i mean it's unbelievable i mean there are no 30 dollar tickets to Knicks games all season much less playoffs okay Ever. there were there haven't been 30 dollar tickets nick okay i can remember when i was a kid and we go to nick games where you have your geo card and i could literally get in for six dollars you know but that's because i'd get a half price ticket on a 12 dollar ticket but and that's because it was the 70s right was <laughs> 40 50 years ago um but 30 you know, what was the carton of minute? milk back then like 89 cents yeah, well you didn't buy cartons of milk they delivered bottled bottled milk outside your house unless well, it, well, uh, outside the house point 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 made <laughs> yeah man now nah, listen i think we're sweeping these fools i think we're sweeping what? these fools 
We sweep okay. them. Listen, man, they not built for the playoffs, okay? They just went to six games with the, the, the mash unit of the version of the Bucks. No Giannis, banged up Dame, and they still took you to six. Yeah, yeah. And they and lost the game when neither of those guys played. Where neither of them played, man. Come on, man. Brunson's about to cook these cats. Tyrese is about to get shown who the real guy is, who the real uh, point guard in the Eastern Conference for years to come is. OB, you're about to get stuffed by OG. And, you know, we got all these guys who want to run around and want to, you know, they, they want to look good when things are going well, but they don't got any, they don't got dogs on their team like we do. We got a bunch of dogs and we got a bunch of guys who are about to show them what playoff basketball is all about. They can get unceremoniously bounced in four games and we can move on to the Eastern Conference finals um, against what looks like it's going to be the Celtics. But uh, the only so uh, it's, that's tonight, right? Cavs versus yeah. versus um, it should be on right now, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I don't think Orlando. either of those teams have a chance to be able Boston? to beat Boston, no. even with. Even with Singer. Chris stops going down. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Let's switch over. Let's talk a little bit of Jets. Jets completed the 2024 draft over the weekend. They notably got this guy Olu Fashanu from Penn State in the first round, 11th overall. That's what I was asking for. Go ahead and get that tackle get that you know i switched I, a couple weeks ago i was saying we got to get somebody who we can have you know play now but when you look at our offensive line some of the injury history some of the age it only makes sense to get a guy there that can definitely step in if anybody goes down and you know possibly who knows we'll see how that all shakes out as far as the offensive line um and then we get this guy malachi Corey in the third round people That's are great. saying he's like a debo i'm watching his his stats, and he seems like he just cannot be tackled. We got Braylon Allen out of Wisconsin in the fourth Love round. You. Big body, a guy for short yardage, and, you know, you also Strong. see him just running away from cats. Strong. And this yeah, guy. Like 225, he did it like 25 times. On, yeah, on yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. He's, he's working out with, he's, and he's working out with King Henry, which, you know, I, I love you the know? sounds of that. And then Jordan Travis in round five. I like it. Uh, you know, a guy that's going to sit who would have been a first round pick if not for a catastrophic ankle injury last year. He has no pressure to come in anytime soon. High character, uh, you know, really just a, like say a, people say he's a gamer. He's a baller. You know, he runs mm -hmm. around. He's got mm -hmm. decent arm strength, not as tall as I would like him to be. Um, and then we rounded it out with Isaiah Davis, another big running back. We got Quantez Stiggers from the Toronto Argonauts and then Mr. Irrelevant. Jalen Key um, with our last and the overall last pick in the draft. Talk to me, big guy. How'd you feel about the Jets, um, how they how they ended up when it came to the draft? I thought they did a very good job. I think Joe, um, Joe Douglas did a good job, the people that he brought in. And um, I think he also did a really good job. Um, I don't know if you've seen some of the names and some of the um, bios on some of the undrafted free agents we brought in. I think he's done a very good job in fleshing this team out. I think the Fashanu pick was a very good pick for the Jets because that's exactly what we need. We need more depth on the line. Those guys, are, he, that guy's going to play, okay? He may not start the first game of the season, but then again, he might, okay? We don't know. Um, you know, we need it, and I'm glad we have it. And I think he got, um, he, he got a couple other guys um, as undrafted free agent um, offensive linemen. I think um, – I think he did a very good job. And, you know, listen, it's great to win the offseason, but it doesn't mean shit, right? But I will tell this. I wanted you to bring up, bring up something on the Jets. I heard, and, I, I, you know, with, with our wide fan base, I could be ruining this for us if we don't have a chance to get the bet in first. But I heard the over-under on wins for the Jets is nine and a half for next year. I want the over on that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you'd really hope that this is at least a 10-win team with a Gotta healthy be. Aaron Rodgers. I mean, yep. you would think, looking at the last year's team, with a healthy Aaron Rodgers, a better offensive line, a defense that, you know, hopefully can be in the same caliber and maybe even possibly be better, 10 wins seems feasible. It does, it does. But as we know, we're one wrong step away from total – you know, a, a, a catastrophic incident and all of a sudden everything is totally different. So I do like that. I probably will sprinkle a little something on that over. 
And it's going to come down to health. I never act like I really know these college prospects. As far as position, we went after the positions that I like. I like that we went after the, um, you know, the 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 line. The, the, I'm sorry, the uh, offensive line to start. I'm glad that we added a quarterback project. I'm glad that you know we went out and we got a bigger running back. Those were all things I was looking for us to do, and we will see how it all plays out. I'm pumped for the Jets. Really looking forward to see how this, um, you know, season comes about, and you know, just going through that whole. Thing that's cool. The cool thing about the NFL is the whole training camp and especially with one Jets drive, like the build up to it gets you really, really excited. Like, you know, we sure. you know, they don't talk about NBA training camp as much. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, it's kind of just like the season starts and it's like, let's go. You know, you start watching a couple preseason games. You get a little bit of hype for uh, for for summer league, especially when you have a bunch of picks and you get to see some young guys. But, you know, it's really going to be interesting just to see how everything plays out with the Jets this year. Make a break for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, a lot of jobs going to be on the line. So, Joe, I hope you did a good job because if we end up having another disappointing season, I don't really see how he survives that. Yeah. And, you know, Nick, I, I know if we have a disappointing season, he's probably out. I personally feel and, you know, I do that. I don't like to see. um I don't like to see drastic changes a lot. I think Joe Douglas is, does a good job, but I do realize that if we don't have a good season, everybody's gone. Yep. Yep. It's a, it's put up or shut up time for both him and Sala. That is for sure. Mets. Yeah. I just looked at the score right now. Not good. Not good. It was 3-3 last I checked. Where are we at now? Yeah. We're down 9-3. to three. Oh, Jesus. Ah, Mets did pull off a walk-off win on Thursday. Uh, they were down by four at one point in that game. They ended up winning it in the 11th with a walk-off from Lindor. The, you know, it's been a, a, a season of, you know, they, 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 they start to give you some hope. They start to look good. Then they fall off a little bit. The pitching has actually been pretty good. We can't hit the ball. And when you look at the Mets overall and some of their numbers, it's just like it, you can't win when, you know, Pete Alonso's hitting 218. Uh, a lot of people want to get away from batting average and they want to say, like, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a thorough stat and it doesn't show enough. 218 is 218, okay? That's right. Lindor, you're hitting 205, all right? So, like, some of these guys, when it comes to our position players, they've just got to step it up, man. Brett Beatty, who started off red hot, he's down to 250. He did have a three-run homer a little bit earlier. Jeff McNeil's hitting 245. Come on, man. We're, we're, not, gonna, we're not going to be able to do anything okay. with an offense that's performing the way it's currently performing. No, we have to do better. We have to get more consistent at the plate. You're hoping that they come around. Look, what you're hoping with the Mets is that they keep their heads above water, stay around 500 or a little bit above, and then, you know, somehow catch lightning in a bottle some point later in the season. I did read where their, their schedule is so much harder in the next few weeks, but then after that, we go through a, a, a run of games, like 60-some-odd games, where we're playing subpar teams that are really subpar. So hopefully, you know, you run into a stretch like that, you could win, you know, 10 out of 15 games or something like that, or 12 out of 15 games, you know, that, that can make a really put a dent in things and really make a difference. But um, we got to stay, we got to stay relevant, you know, and that's easier said than done in the NFL. I mean, in the MLB. Yeah, it's, uh, I just got to figure out a way to get it done and just get a little bit more of a an offensive output and i don't know you know i thought last year after last year it's like you know do we need a new hitting coach like i, I don't know exactly what the answer is but that offensive prowess that we had a couple seasons ago the year that we made it all the way to the end but we ended up um you know giving away the division at the very end but we still won we win over, we went over 90 games that year and the offense was a juggernaut for a lot of the year. And it seems like both last year and this year, guys who have just, I mean, how is, how, how is Jeff McNeil hitting 245? It's brutal. Yeah, a couple brutal. years ago, if you'd have told me that you would get a couple months into the season and Jeff McNeil would be at 245, I'd be like, no possible way. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, 
It's very distressing. Uh, I, I don't know what's happened to that guy, man. And I was reading uh, an article saying may need to start thinking about bringing up this kid, uh, Acuna. You know, Oof. but, but it, because they're saying he's electrifying down there. And if the Mets continue uh, or floundering, maybe bring him up to, you know, get a spark or whatever. But if you bring him up, now you're moving Jeff out to the outfield. And I get, well, you're not sitting down Harrison Bader. You're not going to sit down Nemo, although he's not doing great. So, you know, somebody's going to have to sit. So I don't know what's going to happen there if they bring up a guy like that. What did you think about Vientos getting sent back down after being three for seven with a walk-off homer? Wow. I mean, it's like, man, it's, it's a tough game, man. I mean, uh, three of seven. I mean, what do you, what's the guy supposed to do? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not, I, I'm sure there's reasons behind it that way above my pay grade, but uh, that's, that's kind of rough. I, I get it, honestly, because he's not going to start. And if you, you want this guy playing every day. Playing, right. So, you know, having him up here and having him be a pinch hitter and an occasional spot starter, it's not smart for his development. So I know I'm sure and we know it annoys him. He talked about how it annoyed him at the end of spring training. And, mm -hmm. you know, he had that great moment. He hits the walk off to run Homer. And a couple of days later, you know, back to Syracuse and. Unfortunately, we well un, we, we have a we, we we don't have a spot for him right now. He's a third baseman, and we're not we're not in a position to be able to. I, does he play any other positions? Because I know that uh, Brett Beatty probably isn't moving anywhere anytime soon. Hopefully, so I don't know exactly how that ends up playing out. If we end up moving him at some point, um, just because we don't have a spot for him. I know he's not happy about it, but that's how it goes in the bigs, man. And, you know, unfortunately for him, he's the casualty right now. And so, you know, he'll be playing up in, uh, you know, north uh, western New York. Yeah. What can you do, man? I mean, it's life in the big city, brother. Get used to it. So I know Penix is your guy. But you had to be a little bit surprised when the Falcons, who just signed – Kirk Cousins to four years, 180, decided to draft him with the eighth overall pick. I think they could. Um, I mean, I think it was, I think it was kind of foolish. I mean, with the eighth pick after signing this guy to 100 mil, I, I just I don't I don't know what they're thinking. And I've heard him on I've seen him on TV, Raheem Morris and all that, trying to justify it and whatnot. But I just don't get it, man. I don't get it. It's just silly to me to waste that type of draft capital on a guy who you're hoping, if things go well, won't play for two years, you know? Um, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of, give a lot of reason to believe in their forethought. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. That didn't make a lot of sense. And in that scenario, if he does play in two years, that means Kirk either got hurt or shit the bed for the last two. That's why you're, you know, you, you, if, if you you should have some confidence in this guy that you just went out and gave all this money to, you go out and get the guy that you're expecting to lead your franchise, and you're already thinking about what's going to happen in two years. Because the thing is, is that in two years, if Kirk is playing well, it's not like you're going to be able to trade this kid for a top 10 pick. No. So then you just totally fumble the entire situation. And giving up and using an eighth pick on a guy who, best case scenario, plays two years from now. Worst case scenario, I guess he could have to if, if Kirk is hurt or something like that. Then maybe he comes in. But I don't get it. I don't, and, and and supposedly the the reports are that Cousins was not too happy with it because obviously he wants that eighth pick to be used to do something that's going to enable them to win now. You know, he's an older guy. This is probably his last big deal. He's trying to get it done. And they're already looking for his replacement. I heard them say something about like, you know, this is kind of like the Green Bay model. No, 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 no. Green Bay took those picks in the 20s. Not right. top eight. Top eight right. needs to be a starter. So oh, yeah. I do not get that. He obviously, I, as I said, I wouldn't draft him regardless just because of his extensive injury history. But it seems like universally this is this is looked at as an absolute total reach with, like you said, very little forethought. I read where one GM anonymous, anonymously said, where were the adults in the room? Right. Yeah. I mean, somebody obviously in that room, just absolutely and somebody with power, obviously, just love this kid. Love them, love them, love them. 
and said, if we got any chance, we got to grab him. But with the eighth pick, man, no. With the 18th pick, maybe I could see it. You know, 22nd pick, okay. But the eighth pick of the draft, no. No. That don't make a lot of sense to me. Because that's the other thing, too. No one was drafting that guy before 50, I don't think. If that. Okay, Nick, I think he would have been drafted in the 20s, cause, like you said, because of his um, injury history. So they, they bid against themselves, and they played themselves, you know? No LeBron, Steph, or KD in the second round for the first time since 2010. Oh, well, you know, Bron, Bron, sorry. And um, Steph, Steph, you know. I mean, they just weren't good enough, obviously. You know, they didn't pull it together. And obviously, the Draymond foolishness cost them a lot of games this year. And the KD thing, that Phoenix situation. Wait, 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 wait. Did you hear the statement by the Phoenix owner? No. When? When did this come out? came out like today, I think. You need to pull it up right now. It should be a – the man is delusional. He says, oh, all these people are saying these terrible things, that the sons of this, the sons of that. The sons are fine. We are fine. We did a great job. We had a great season and blah, blah. And I'm like, wait, what? Is he watching the same thing as everyone else? It's, it's remarkable what he said. I, I, I get it. Maybe he's a sales guy and he's just hyping things up. But, dude, uh, sounds a little bit... Um, you know, rose-colored glasses to me is what I would say. Um, did you find it? Are you reading it? Mm, no, I'm having a little bit of trouble. I'm looking at this. This is from Robert Sarver. So, no, I did not find it just well, yet. No. But um, listen, man. I, a disaster. I, absolute disaster. The amount of apathy that I saw Ooh. from the house is not on fire is one of yes. his lines in this statement. Um, yeah, no, so – the narrative yes, that the yeah, house is, is burning is incorrect. The Phoenix Suns are doing great. Excellent. Not as good as we want to be. Not as good as we're going to do next year. And that's what we're going to figure out, what we've got to tweak, modify, and adjust to win a championship next year. Yeah, he definitely sounds like he's like trying to run um, you know, a sales meeting, um, you know, a, a, a huddle and get everybody hyped up. You know, um, I thought Frank did a great job given the circumstance. We assembled a re- really talented team, prim- primarily three scores. Whenever you try to get guys to adjust and adapt their games, there's a transition time. It's sometimes a struggle, but I thought he did a great job this year. Okay. Well, Suns had a terrible season. The apathy from their fans, both you and I know people who are Suns fans who were just so disgusted by the end of the season that they weren't even that interested in the playoffs. And they went out and got absolutely dog walked by Ant Edwards and the Minnesota Timberwolves. Anthony Edwards punked them. He punked them. He's totally. woofing at Durant. He's dunking on Durant. Bradley Beal is nowhere to be seen except for when it's time to cash a check. And they don't have a point guard. Looks like Eric Gordon cares more than anybody else. It, 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 was, a, it was a disaster of a season and a disaster of an ending. And, you know, Durant is talking about how he's looking forward to coming back and building something and all. Well, I don't know, man. I think something's got to give there. I think something's got to give there. And no, I Durant's getting to the point where he's like a leper. It's like, yo, I, we can't bring him over here because he'll infect right. this whole right. squad. Right. And Bradley Beal, that contract is yeah. the worst contract maybe in all of professional sports. Disaster. And then Booker, you know, reports from you guys screaming, A. Hey, he's saying that. He wants out, and then he specifically wants to come to New York. I don't want to get too deep into that because I think we have, you know, bigger fish to fry right this moment, and we can worry about that in the offseason. But that's an interesting theory. That's an interesting report. If there's one thing about Stephen A that we know is that he is pretty plugged in, and he definitely has been on the right side of some predictions when it comes to what guys are going to end up doing when it comes to free agency and are or, or, or forcing to forcing their team to move them to a particular place. And we have a ton of picks and they have absolutely no picks because they mortgaged them all trying to build this super team. So right. that could be interesting, man, but their crash and burn this season has been, it's been, it's been, it's been like astonishing to watch, you know, with all of the yeah. different expectations that they have for them to not only 
find themselves in the lower half of the Western Conference, but then to get unceremoniously just straight swept out in the first round with only one of the games even really being close and Bradley Beal averaging like 15 points on like 39 minutes a game while getting paid $50 million a year. Unreal. It's embarrassing. And this guy, you know, uh, Matt Ishiba, Ishibia, how do you say it? Ish, yeah. Ishbia. 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 Yeah. yeah. Ishbia. I understand you're trying to, you know, have a brave face and you're trying to get up there and, you know, exude confidence and everything, but nobody feels that way other than you. Right. Um, uh, one telling stat I thought was really interesting. In the Knicks Sixers series, after six games, the difference in the amount of points scored by each team was one point, right, between the two teams. The difference in four games <laughs> for the uh, Suns and, and Minnesota – it's like 85 points Waxed. between the two teams. They got smoked, man. They got absolutely smoked. It's embarrassing. I did hear somebody bring up a good point earlier, too. We, you know, you look at it and, you know, listen, I think this guy, Devin Booker, is a great player and maybe, you know, bringing him in, blah, 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 with, um, with, with Brunson. But the thing is, Nick, that somebody brought up a good point. People think you just want to bring in guys who are talent. They didn't think before they put together that Phoenix team. They don't fit together. They do the same thing. They're all good jump shooters and scorers, all three of them, but they don't add other things to it. It, 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 is, it is a case study in big game hunting, but not putting together a proper team such as the Knicks have done. You know, I mean, it's really stark, frankly, you know, when you see that, because honestly, before the season, there were a lot of people saying, Ooh, watch out for Phoenix. And some people pick something oh, yeah. to go to their championship. Oh, yeah. You know, because they thought, oh, wow, what a team. No, they're not a very good team. They're not a very good team at all. And like you said, when you started saying apathy, I actually thought you were talking about the players on the court because I saw apathy on the court from those guys that I thought was unbelievable. I, I, I feel like if Tibbs is their coach, he's getting into trouble because he's running onto the court and tackling one of his players because he'd be so upset. I mean, it was it was embarrassing how how lackadaisical and lame these guys were acting on the court. I never seen anything like it. It's not a video game, man. Nope. You can't just put some parts together and hope that they all work out right. and say, "Well, this guy's good and this guy's good and this guy's good." It's about right. how they mesh as a team and as a unit. The team has no point guard, so <laughs> you're going to be asking one of those guys to do something that they don't typically want to do. And just because everybody has scored a lot before doesn't mean that they can all score together when they're all sharing the floor. Okay. And when they have other guys who want to operate in the same spaces as them and they have don't have anybody whose mindset is, I want to get everybody in the correct space and get them going. You need that on a basketball team and they don't have it. And they have very few like just absolute dog type role players. Then they lose Grayson Allen, who he's actually kind of one of those guys for them. Um, right. Like I said, I thought Eric Gordon looked like he was trying to, you know, get after it and play well, but Bradley Beal, I mean, come on, man, this guy's not good. He's always hurt. He is wildly overpaid and he consistently like, like uh, I heard somebody make this point. I forget who I might've been Alan Hahn. He said, can you remember one Black Bradley Beal playoff game? No. Is there like a playoff performance that he had no. that you saw at some point in his career and you're like, yo, remember that game? I mean, even guys that like, Not you don't, even guys that you don't love, your 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 Hardens, your Embiid's, you've seen them do some amazing shit in big spots before. I've never seen. I, I can't even think of a game where it's like, yeah, Bradley Beal, he balled in. But I can't even think of that. He's had nope. some great regular season games, but when it comes time for you know late April, May, and June. He's nowhere to be found. He's typically, you know, on vacation already. And he was an absolute no-show in that series. Ant Edwards, shout to him. That kid is 22 years old, taking the league by storm, wow. making sure that he everybody sees that he is that guy and he's going to be for years to come. Um, you know, Cat is back. He looked pretty good in that series. And that's just a good team, man. That's a good team. That next series between them and um, the, the Nuggets, that's going to be series man i can't wait to see those games and how they play out and you know i think whoever wins that series is going to uh, come out again come out of the uh, west and meet the knicks in the uh, nba finals yeah that is my hope as well um that phoenix team though nick as i've always said you know 
one of your best players has to be a leader and nobody there is a leader. Nobody there is an alpha dog. I mean, okay, nobody there is an alpha dog. And see, this is what a lot of people don't get. You don't have to be loud and verbose to be an alpha dog. Jalen Brunson can show you that. I mean, there's nobody, no one would dispute the fact that Jalen Brunson is the leader of this team. And it's not just because he's the best player. It's because he's the leader and the team follows him, you know, and he is obviously the best player. Um, but that Phoenix team doesn't have a leader. I mean, you know, they all just want to show up and hoop. So this is what you get. Now, the Knicks' path to the NBA Finals may have gotten slightly easier mm. because Christoph Porzingis, non-contact, comes up lame. He's got a calf injury. Yeah. They say he could miss anywhere from a couple weeks to several mm. weeks. With that, with the calf, you know it's one of those things that Never know. you've got to just give him treatment and see how it progresses. And I'm sorry, but Porzingis, he's not the guy who's going to be like really playing through injury. He's just not. No. Okay? He's never been that guy, and it was one of the reasons that things went sour between he and the Knicks at the end of his tenure with um with the Knicks, you know, back in at the end of his rookie deal. And I said all season, the reason that you want to get to a point where you can avoid Boston for as long as you possibly can in the playoffs is because you got to see this guy Porzingis stay healthy throughout an entire playoff run, something he's never been able to do. He's never been that mm -hmm. deep before. Drag this guy into the deep waters and see if he can swim. And I don't root for injury on anybody. I Listen, Por I, I'm, I, I look at Porzingis fondly. I mean, I, I really liked him when he was a Nick. I was devastated when we traded him, especially what we got back for, for him. And um, – you know, now I look at him in Boston, he's a very good fit there, but now he comes up lame and his status for the rest of the playoffs is definitely going to be up in the air. And he really, really changes that team as far as how you have to guard the pick and roll with him being able to pick and pop and have unlimited range with that height and that high release. And now they start to look a little bit more vulnerable. What did you think when you saw uh, Porzingis go down and what do you think that means for Boston and the rest of these playoffs? Well, I feel bad for her. A singer, um, just him personally, he seemed like a, you know, I've always said he's a good, good guy, but, um, you know, listen, as far as competition goes, that's life, you know, I mean, again, life in the big city, you know, we're dealing with injuries. Okay. So I, I don't want to hear about nobody else's injuries. And just like with Embiid, if you get on the floor, don't talk to me about injuries. You're playing. That's it. Um, I personally think, especially in an injury like that, he's going to have a tough time coming back from that. Um, you know, in this kind of game, um, you know, a very tall guy, clearly long, sinewy and all that, the, the muscles and all that and running up and down the court on that bad calf. Come on, man. It's not it's not, you know, and trying to jump all over the place. No, it's not going to work out well, especially in a much more physical postseason. No, that, that's that's a recipe for disaster. Now, there's still a very good team without him. OK, and I do think. I think that the Knicks have a shot playing against the Celtics, either with him or without him. Much better shot, obviously, without him. What I will say is if the, if the Celtics do end up coming out of the East, I don't know that they win it all without Porzingis. I don't think they're going to beat either Denver or Minnesota from out West without Porzingis. They're just, they're just not. You know, they, need, they need that other element in their game to have a shot against those West Coast teams. But I think the Knicks got a shot, man. But let's see what we could do in Indiana first. That's the main thing. If we can take care of Indiana, then we worry about whatever else is down the road and if um, Porzingis is healthy or not. Catch us every week on YouTube or wherever you find your podcasts. Please follow, like, comment, and subscribe. And make sure you hit that notification button on all platforms. Really appreciate all the love. We try to stay as current as possible. So episodes will be dropping on Thursdays, Fridays, depending on the Knicks schedules. You can find us on, on all socials at he underscore did this to me. Love you, big guy. Love you, kid. <laughs>